God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, as we celebrate this Ascension Day, we're going to focus on our second lesson. That's the one recorded in Revelation chapter 19, where John says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and he makes war. The word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is that rider on the white horse, my dear Christian friends? You know the Bible makes the case that God is present everywhere, right? The psalmist says, where can I go and hide from you? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to the depths, you're there. God is with us here. He's with us at home. He's with us in our cars. He's with us with our families. He's with us when we're alone. God's present everywhere. We can't hide from him. Similarly, the Bible makes the case that God is omniscient, which is a fancy word that means that he knows everything. Since God knows everything, it means that he can read your mind. It means that God can read the thoughts of your heart. There's a verse in the Bible that explains that even before the prayers come to our lips, God already knows what they are. All of this has prompted some people to say, well, if God's present everywhere, and if God already knows everything, he's seen the future, he determines the future. He knows the past. Then why don't you do something, God? Aren't you here in this world? Don't you see what's going on? Don't you understand the, the stress and pressure that Christians are under in this world? Christianity is ebbing. It ain't flowing in America. In the rest of the world, there's hostility, there's persecution, there's hatred, there's violence, there's martyrdom. You think martyrdom is only something that took place in the very first century? Peter, as history has it, was crucified upside down. Or crazy Nero, who fiddled while Rome burned. He was the guy who used to feed Christians as fuel to the fire. That was rather delightful for Nero. No, no. Christians are dying in record numbers all around the world. They're doing it in the name of and for the sake of Jesus Christ. Martyrdom, Christian martyrdom is still alive and well. Some people have reasoned that if God's present everywhere and he sees all this that's going on, maybe the real reason is that God is, you know, kind of a wimp. He's love and he's forgiveness and he's peace and he's joy and he's happiness and he's blessings and he's patient and he's long-suffering. And as long as God is forgiving and patient and loving, is that the reason why he doesn't do something about these people? Is that the reason why he doesn't step in and do something about all this stuff? See, the Christians usually are the ones who make this case that maybe God is kind of wimpy Unbelievers don't really think about God at all, so they don't really care. Some Christians, I'm sorry, some non-Christians, maybe they're persecuting Christians because they've reasoned that God's not going to do anything anyway. So it kind of gives me some jolly and some delight to pick on the Christians. I don't know, you think God's wimpy? Maybe it's a good day to have ascension then. Because... Did you read this text? Did you hear what God said? Did you see this rider on the white horse? Because that's a bad dude. Riding on a white horse, with justice he's making war. He's got blood on the bottom of the robes that he's wearing into battle. He's throwing down. He's like some vigilante that makes every Hollywood actor look like a wimp by way of comparison. He's coming to settle the score. He's coming to wage war. He's coming to carry out consequences. That's what this text is. That's how this text reads. You want to know who that rider on the white horse is? It's none other 
than the wimp. Jesus Christ, whom the text ends by calling King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is Jesus Christ saying, yes, I came into the world. Yes, I came to bring peace. Yes, I died on the cross. I rose from the dead. And on this day, I ascended to the right hand of God in heaven. But don't you dare mistake me for a wimp. Don't you think that I'm going to let sins go unpunished? There's not going to be any score that's left unsettled. And there's not going to be anybody who wags his finger and makes a mockery of God for whom and with whom I am not going to bring justice. In this case, the Bible says real clearly that he comes to wage war. And we already know that he came to bring peace. So with all deference to Leo Tolstoy, we will, for our devotion, look at this text as war and peace. Who is this rider on the white horse? Let's make a case. Let's just acknowledge what the Bible says here. The rider is called faithful and true. Jesus is called faithful and true earlier in the book of Revelation. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire. For those of you who are here a few weeks back, remember this from Revelation chapter 1? This is a, a nod to his omniscience. He sees clearly. He knows the thoughts and the attitude of your heart. You're not going to be able to stand before Jesus Christ on the last day and say, oh no, I believed in you with my whole heart, my whole strength, and all of my, all of my mind. Jesus knows exactly who you are and what you believe. You're not going to be able to pull one over on him because his eyes are like blazing fire. He sees clearly. On his head are many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. We'll talk about that later. And his name is the Word of God. You know that in the beginning of the book of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, uh, was God. The armies of heaven were following him, which is an indication that this rider on the white horse is coming from heaven, and he's followed by the angelic host who are riding with him into battle. Their robes, though, are all white and clean and pristine. They're not doing the fighting. Jesus is the one who's doing the fighting because he's got blood on his road. And out of his mouth comes a, a, a sword with which to strike down the nations. With which to strike down the nations because he's going to be one who's waging war. And finally, it says, he treads the winepress on the fury of his wrath. And on the bottom of his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who, what other character in the supernatural realm or in the physical, or in the earthly realm. Who else can this be? He's faithful and true. His name is the Word of God. He comes to make war and peace and settle scores and justice. Who else is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords? This is Jesus Christ who's riding in on the white horse. Let's take a look at the first phrase that the Bible calls him. He is faithful and he is true. This, of course, is a nod to the fact that whatever Jesus Christ has said in the course of the Bible is going to come true. Everything that he said. So when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, the wages of sin is death. If the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life, then the gift of God is eternal life. When the Bible says that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, that is faithful, that is true, that's going to happen. And when the Bible says whoever does not believe will be condemned, that is just as true as those who believe and baptize will be saved. You see, when the Bible says in John 3.16, this is the forgiveness and the peace part. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But two verses later, the Bible says, if you don't believe in the name of God's one and only son, you stand condemned already because you've rejected the gospel, you've rejected Jesus, you've rejected his peace. When the Bible says that Jesus' name is faithful and true, that means to say that Jesus is going to come and settle and do whatever the Bible has said he's going to do. And in the very next phrase, he says he is coming with justice to wage war. He is going to judge and to make war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. See, when Jesus comes at the last time, remember in our gospel lesson, actually it was in our first lesson from Acts, 
the disciples are standing looking at Jesus with their jaws dropped. Who's ever seen something like this where a man just gradually rises up into the skies and the angel had to come and say, what are you guys doing with this goofy look on your face? The same way you saw Jesus left is the same way he's going to come back. That's what this text is. When Jesus returns, he's going to come back and he's going to judge. And he's going to make war on every last person who has defied him and who has denied the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's true that when Jesus came, he came to make peace and died on the cross to bring the forgiveness of sins. But there's a whole raft of people in this world who said, that's a bunch of baloney. God's a myth. This is fairy tales. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you sow according to your sinful nature, the Bible says you will reap destruction. And when Jesus comes on this last day, make no mistake, Jesus will hand people over in justice to all their sins if they have defied and denied the name of God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. He will make war on them. He will give them what they've asked for. If you deny the gospel, the law is the only thing that's left. And God will give them their condemnation and it will have been earned justly. In the back half of the text, the Bible explains a little bit more about how it is that Jesus is doing. Get a load of this image and you tell me if this is the picture of someone who's wimpy. He's dressed in a white robe and his white robe is dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. A lot of people think that the blood that is on Jesus' robe in this picture as he's writing in on the white robe, it's kind of stained on the bottom down here. Well, this is the blood of the martyrs, right? This is the blood of the saints. Or maybe this is the blood that Jesus shed on the cross to make peace with people. It's not either. Because this text explains that Jesus is going to carry out justice. If people have rejected God's peace, if they've denied the blood that he shed on the cross, then Jesus is going to come and defeat all of his enemies. The blood that's on his robe is a consequence and a result of all the enemies that Jesus is trouncing and, tra uh, and trampling, as if to say, there is nobody who's going to defy me. All my enemies are left slaughtered. All my enemies are left defeated. And here is Jesus who's done it alone and who is riding in on the white horse as a deliverer with all of the enemies defeated. There's a fabulous passage in the book of Ephesians that talks about Jesus' ascension to the right hand of God and says Jesus is going to heaven leading captives in his train. You know, in the Old Testament, when you defeated somebody... Uh, similar to the way sometimes sports do it today, you have a parade. And you champion the fact that we're the winners, but everybody else is the losers. In the Old Testament, when kings went to war, they led the captives, that is, the enemy kings and all of those people who have been taken captives, the hostages and the slaves. They led them all in a parade as if to say, they're the losers and we're the winners. So when Jesus goes to heaven as his ascension, he leads captives in his train. There is nobody who stands taller than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's the winner. He's the victor. And this picture of him riding in on a white horse is to indicate to Christian people that he will guard and protect you and he will defend his church against all these people. We think that they're probably pushing back on us or making our life miserable. They don't win. Christ wins. And this graphic picture of Jesus riding in and executing and carrying out his justice fully and finally is our comfort and a joy and our hope. It really is. It really is. Because in this earth, in this world, we, we get worked over by these things. We're minded to think that somehow, what, the unbelievers are winning the battle? That's what we think? that we're losing, they can run their mouths louder, they have a bigger microphone in the media. The Bible says God's enemies do not win. He will make war against them and he will settle every score and deliver them over into every single consequence. We're on the winning side. We're on the winning side because Jesus Christ has made war with our enemies. 
And we know the main way in which Jesus has made war with the main enemy that we have. Jesus went to war with our sin. You see, he was the one who lived the verse that the wages of sin is death. He died. He died on the cross. He suffered the abandonment of God in hell. The Bible says the punishment that brought us peace was laid on him. And when God suffered, Jesus suffered the indignity of God's forsakenness. That was Jesus taking our place. That was Jesus waging war on our sin. So that we could be brought to peace with God. After Jesus died on the cross and rose again, there are, so many Bible, there are so many Bible verses that say, because we've been justified by faith, we're at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. Hell is not a concern for us. Our sins are not a concern for us because Jesus has done something. He's no wimp. He's stared every enemy straight in the eye and said, come, bring it on. And he has suffered for it. He has died for it. He has waged war for it, and he has conquered it. And the fact that on this day he has ascended the right hand of God in heaven with all the captives in his train is his way of parading before us. We're on the winning team. We, believers and Christians, are on the winning team. We Christians are at peace because God has made war against every single one of our enemies. That really means something, you know, in the day-to-day -day life, when the Christian church is losing, or people are falling away, or even when our own hearts and our own consciences condemn us, or when the devil bugs us and makes us feel you're not forgiven, your sins are too big and ugly and ornery, and Jesus can't possibly forgive that one, and you've let your loved one down, and whatever other lies the devil or anybody else wants to whisper in your ears to make you feel as though somehow you're outside the peace of God, we can come right back, we can come right back to these ascension truths and we can see that here is Jesus Christ riding in on the white horse, defeating every single enemy with the blood of their defeated bodies staining the bottom of his garments, who stakes his victorious flag in the ground and says, you may not have them, they belong to me. He is king of kings and lord of lords, and boy, are we happy to belong to his kingdom. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and keep your minds through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.